I'm Manisa Nakhmi, founder of the Little Book Company, Pakistan's first e-book seller and publisher. And this is our fourth episode of our new podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome today Tahira Nakhmi, who is with us for a conversation. Assalamualaikum, Tahira. Assalamu alaikum, Maniza. How are you? I'm very good. Tahira, I would uh, love to have a conversation with you today um, about your first novel, The History Teacher of Lahore, and about your short story collections, which include uh, Dying in a Strange Country. I love the name of this, and I want to talk about that. And uh, Athar of Roses and Other Stories. And I know that you're um, a translator as well, and you've translated major works of uh, literature, such as Ismat Chuktai's short stories, and your, collect, um, your translation of Femida Riaz's uh, poetry book, The Body Torn, is on the Little Book Company's ebook site. So where would you like to begin? <laughs> First of all, let me thank you very much, Maniza, for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk. It's interesting how much uh, we writers like to talk about our work. And uh, it's also uh, nice to be able to do it because one doesn't get this opportunity all the time. And I'm tired of talking to students in the classroom all the time So about other things. So it, it, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to talk about my work and, and myself and my work. Uh, so, um, I, I, do you want me to begin at the beginning, uh, you know, with the short story collections and the translations? I could do that, and Thank then we could go on to um, the later work and the, the novel. Well, I would actually like you to begin by telling me about your students and your, your teaching experience. Okay. Uh, well, I've been teaching uh, Urdu language and literature at New York University uh, for about 20 years now. And when I first started, the program was very small. Uh, we just had one, uh, we were offering only one course. We had one class and it was elementary uh, Urdu one. Mm -hmm. And we had a few students. And this uh, particular, it's interesting, I should tell you this actually, uh, what was happening was that Urdu and Hindi were being taught or have been taught or actually still being taught uh, in uh, every university or college where um, Urdu and Hindi were offered. So they were off, they were taught together. In other words, in uh, you had to students had to learn the Devanagari script and then they would learn the grammar and then they would be introduced to the Urdu script and then they would learn, uh, well, learn, you know, when you learn Hindi, uh, you also learn Urdu automatically, mm -hmm. but then they would do more, more of the Urdu with the script, et cetera. So the, there were these dual programs that were, um, uh, you know, at that, at that time, I mean, I'm talking about uh, the earliest possible time, 19, 80s or the 90s mm -hmm. when uh, these programs were being run and so um, I was asked by um, Dr. Fran Pritchett who is a very dear friend um, to in 2001 to come and teach um, Urdu uh, at uh, Columbia and of uh, course we know that Dr. Fran Pritchett is uh an expert on uh, Urdu Ghalib, particularly yes. Ghalib. Particularly Ghalib. Her work on Ghalib is absolutely wonderful. And uh, she is one of the first people to have done a tashri of Ghalib, an explication of Ghalib's work in English. And, uh, you know, she's a, a remarkable scholar of Ghalib. So she was going away on sabbatical, uh, not on sabbatical, I think she was just going away for a couple of semesters and, she called me and we had never met and she asked me if I'd be interested in teaching Urdu. So just to uh, just to add to the uh, variety of things that I was involved with, I had been teaching English at Western Connecticut State University for about 13 years before that. Mm -hmm. So that was my real job. That was what I was trained to do. 
And I was teaching uh, comp and lit at the time. And so we moved from Connecticut to Westchester County. And that was when uh, Fran got in touch with me. And the reason she got in touch with me is that I had been working since 1983 on Isma Chukhtai and Manto. I had done, started doing translations of their work. And so by then, by 2001, I had published, uh, you know, quite a few uh, works by, Is by Ismat, by Isma Chukhtai. And I had already uh, published a collection of stories by Manto. And all of the work, all of the work by Ismat was being published by what was at that time Kali for Women Press and then later became uh, Women Unlimited. Uh, and my publisher was and has been happily uh, Ritu Menon. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. And so she so so I think that is why that is why Fran got in touch with me because she knew of the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise I had no experience in teaching Urdu per se. So that's how I ended up at Columbia. And then I was there for about um uh, about two semesters, and it was a wonderful experience. It was a great place to be. And then, you know, I uh, I went that was over and then just as i as we i was wondering what to do next uh whether to go back to teaching english or you know something else um i got a call from nyu where this wonderful young bulgarian sanskritist gabriela ilieva uh had been hired to teach hindi and uh, so she was looking for someone to teach Urdu and she was looking to separate the tracks, which would have been, uh, you know, the first time ever that Urdu and Hindi tracks would be separated. And the reason for her uh, motivation her, for that was that 9-11 had happened and there were tensions in the classroom where uh, the uh, the Pakistani students didn't see any reason why they should be studying Devnagri uh, slash Hindi, and the Indian students in the cl same classroom were wondering why they had to do the Urdu script, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know what what that situation was. Well, oh, actually, why but, don't you tell us why that would be so? Well, why it's so entirely. Ha. Uh, so what happened was that. Uh, uh, what Gabriella saw, because I never experienced that since I never taught that classroom, but Gabriella experienced a kind of, uh, so so this was, uh, you know, it, it, the whole uh, Islamophobic uh, situation that arose after 9-11 mm -hmm. sort of swept along the, the students and everything else that was happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, Muslims in at universities and in uh, students in classrooms. And I think that uh, although there was no real reason for hostility between the Indian and Pakistani students, it or students who were studying uh, Urdu and those who were studying Hindi um, and had been doing, I mean, they're still doing it together at Columbia and nearly all of the other universities. Uh, but, uh, but Gabriella felt that there was this kind of reluctance on the part of these students. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly how to explain that, but I feel that uh, it seemed as though, uh, uh, you know, it seemed as though the, the, the Indian students felt, well, you know, we don't need to know Urdu because it's not our language. And uh, so, you know, this is what happens when you have a situation like that, older hostilities and tensions come to the fore. And, and you, uh, were all the students of Indian and Pakistani descent? For the most part, for the most part. There, there are always a few students who are either, um, um, you know, what we call non heritage students mm -hmm. and but they're few they're always few and far between mostly uh it is uh, uh students who are either taking um who are taking urdu or hindi because they're involved with the south asian studies major mm -hmm. and or as in the case of nyu where we don't have a south asian studies major 
the reason for taking uh, Urdu or Hindi would be to um, uh, satisfy the language requirements. And so students of Indian and Pakistani heritage uh, descent uh, were, were interested in taking the language because it was something that they felt, uh, you know, would help them, or they were they had links with it because of the family, because of the culture, because of the their parents' relationship with the country, etc. And that is still what's happening. Students are taking Urdu, uh, and and uh, well, I would say about ninety nine percent of them are uh, heritage students are taking it because it makes them feel closer to their heritage and it creates links uh, between their life in the US as Americans and their parents who are immigrants right. and carry the baggage of culture. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, as I'm talking about this, perhaps I should also tell you uh, that um, at a certain time, I think around, so anyway, let me finish the story. So what happened is that Gabriela was looking for a, a person to teach Urdu at NYU. Mm -hmm. And so she talked to Fran because Fran knew her and she knew Fran. And she said, is there someone who can teach Urdu at NYU? And of course, Fran and I had just, you know, become acquainted and I had been teaching at Columbia. And Fran said, oh, yes, of course, there's Tahira Naqvi and uh, she's been teaching here. And of course, uh, I'll send her along, so to speak. So um, I I went in and, uh, uh, you know, some uh, Gabriela interviewed me and she's now one of my dearest, oldest and closest friends, of course. But she interviewed me and a couple of other uh, professors uh, who had absolutely nothing to do with Hindi or Urdu interviewed me, as is the case when these, uh, uh, you know, uh, things happen. Um, and I was hired, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I've been there all this time, and uh, I was initially an adjunct for about a year, two years, I think, a year and a half, and then I was offered the position full-time, and so I've been teaching there Urdu full-time after that. So um, I don't know where we well, cut ourselves off. And do you um, teach uh, some of the works that you've translated? Like, do you teach the works of Esma Chiptai? Uh, so, so, so I don't teach my own work, obviously, because that's in English, and we have to do Urdu texts. We are we're working with Urdu texts, but in my advanced classes, advanced Urdu classes, I teach uh, Manto, and I teach uh, occasionally. I will teach Ismat. Uh, you know, the Ismat is very Urdu of Ismat's uh, stories is extremely uh, difficult, complex. It's. Uh, um, it's, I have to tell you the story as I go along. Interrupt me when I talk too much. No, it's a natural story. So, uh, because, you know, when I go off on a tangent, I, it's just I you one, thing, one thing leads to another. But I had this student who was uh, non-heritage and he was doing some work uh, and, you know, he had learned the language and he was quite proficient and he uh, was working on a story by Ismat. And so I uh, I gave him um, um, Ismat's beautiful and absolutely fantastic, wonderful story called Chauthi Ka Jora. Uh, and he, I said, you know, why don't you start reading it and uh, we'll discuss it after you've read a couple of pages. So he comes back the following day and we sit down and we're uh, ready to talk about what he has just read. And he asks me point blank, is this Urdu? And uh, I looked at him and he, he was serious. And he said that the Urdu is so difficult in this story that I, I, I couldn't really read it. And I mean, I read it, but I mean, I couldn't really understand anything. Mm. And so Ismat is difficult. So I don't often teach Ismat in Urdu, but Manto is much easier to handle. So I teach him. And uh, other than that, I've been lately and in the past as well, been teaching a lot of poetry. I'd like to come back uh, to Ismat Chiptai for a moment. Sure. Uh, of all her stories that you've translated, mm -hmm. all the stories you've read, which one or which two or three stand out for you as being just uh, really the most important works or the most stunning? Yeah. 
uh, with Ismet, you know, what happens is, or what has happened is that her very controversial story, Lehaf, which is the quilt, mm -hmm. uh, which is about this uh, Begum's uh, relationship, sexual relationship with her maid, has uh, sort of overpowered all of her other work. And she herself, in her interviews and letters and conversations and essays, has lamented the fact that this has happened. Yeah. It is a great story. It is a remarkable you know, piece of writing. It's very, very um, uh, important uh, because it broke all kinds of taboos and rules. And she was a woman and she was writing about uh, this relationship between these two women and the protagonist was a the narrator, I should say, first person narrator, was a young girl who was about, you know, 12 or 13. Anyway, uh, so when one starts looking at Ismet, or as I should say, when I started looking at Ismet, I'd already read Lehaf and quite a bit of Ismet before um, as a, you know, as 16-year-old, 17-year-old back in Pakistan. So I had to pick up Ismet again. I started reading it again. And I had to agree with her. The Lehaf is is a very important story, but uh, it it sort of has uh, overpowered and has sort of um, put aside for most readers Ismet's other stories, which are really amazing and very important. And they're Can you talk about one or two of them. Yes. So <laughs> one of them, of course, is Jyoti Jora. Uh, which translated loosely would be like a, a wedding shroud. Um, and uh, so in that particular story, uh, Ismet deals with her favorite subject, which was the oppression of women uh, by society, not by people per se, not by a man or not by a particular woman, but by society, which has created uh, these... Um, rules and regulations and mores and this particular patriarchal culture that is part of it. It's not all patriarchy. There are women involved, mothers, mothers-in-laws, other women who are part of that uh, particular uh, society, which oppresses women. Mm -hmm. And so this is about a very uh, lower middle class house, Muslim household. And uh, there is, there are these various women. There is the mother, and a daughter who is of uh, marriageable age, whose name is Kubra, and um, a young, a younger sister, who is the narrator. And Ismet used to move back and forth between her narrators or points of view. So the story would begin sometimes in the third person, and suddenly in the middle of the story you would find that uh, there is a first person narrator. And then it would go back to the the, the the third person narrator. And sometimes you would see Ismet suddenly emerge, uh, giving an opinion, editorializing, or just, you know, uh, stepping in into the story. So she had this very interesting style of writing. So in that story, basically, you know, we, this is kind of story we, uh, those of us who read Urdu Afsana or have been reading Urdu Afsana and grown up reading it, uh, where there is this young girl who uh, is uh, is of marriageable age, and of course there is no money for the dowry. There is no uh, young man in the uh, in the picture who will come and uh, you know uh, take her away. And, and uh, there is there there are no opportunities uh, in the family. So in walks this cousin, a cousin from somewhere who is taking an exam and needs a place to stay. And he is, of course, immediately uh, welcomed into this family by the, by the, the mother. The, 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 the family has no father. The, the, the mother is a widow because the father died several years ago, of course, exacerbating the situation even more in terms of their means and, and what they have and they don't have. So anyway, it's very traditional. Kubra, the, the young man comes in and everybody thinks, well, he's a prospective groom. He's going to be the person that Kubra will marry. And so the mother and she has a friend who is in cahoots with her and the two of them 
begin this campaign of trying to uh, uh, somehow keep this young man uh, interested in Kubra. Mm -hmm. Of course, Kubra is not ever uh, in front of him. She's never there. She's always in Parda. This is the time we're talking about when Muslim women, Muslim girls were in Parda. And so she is not to be, and you know, especially if she he's supposed to be a prospective husband or groom. So she never appears before him. The younger sister is sent in. And I talk about this a lot in my conversations about this particular story. And people are, it's very hard for people to understand how this happens. But uh, those of us, and I'm sure you know the, of this too, that in our uh, culture, the bride's sisters are, I, and I, I don't want it to sound crude, but they're sort of offered up to this uh, prospective bridegroom as, a, as someone uh, that will uh, attract him to the idea of this other woman who is the sister who's in hiding. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a kind of uh, what we would one call. Get one free? Uh -huh. no, no, it's not even free. It's just that they're just there. They're, they're going to, there's a kind of um, very, um, um, uh, it's a kind of flirtation that mm -hmm. happens. And because the, the young man cannot see the girl that he will marry the sister becomes a a way for him to know her let's put it that way well, and so, so he can even her personality by having all these other attractive women in the mm. room as well yeah yes okay so mm. he so i mean nothing really happens i mean generally speaking in the in the general cultural aspect of it but in this particular story, the mother, the mother and her friend, they push this young sister, the, the, the younger sister, to go in and talk to him, take him food, give him the halwa that Kubra has been making. In the meantime, Kubra is in this dark kitchen cooking all kinds of fancy foods and delicacies which they can't afford to make. Uh, for this man. So there is this really, I mean, it sounds in telling, it sounds very, uh, it sounds terrible. It sounds very uh, cruel cr and crass, but it is cruel and crass and it is terrible what happens, but it's so deeply ingrained in the society, in especially, I think still, I, I shouldn't say then, I should say still, where marriage is very important, where people who can't afford dowries have go through this terrible pain and this terrible anguish as to how to present their daughters to prospective um, in-laws so that they may, you know, how to, again, to put it in, in, a, in a crude sort of way, how to make them marketable. So, um, so this, this younger sister, who is is appalled, of course, by all of this, and has no sympathy for this young man, and has no desire to go in and give him the food and serve him, or you know, talk to him, because her her older sister, who she thinks is going to marry her, is is in the kitchen slaving over the the stove. Uh, cooking for this man and she also in the process knits a sweater for him and uh, then she takes the sweater to this um, to the to the young man the the point of all of this is that there is a um, a kind of um, campaign that has been undertaken to entice this young man to uh, have a very favorable opinion of the household of these people, of the girl that is in hiding and whom he doesn't see, uh, and then come back at some point with a proposal. Hmm. And of course, none of this happens. I mean, it's I mean, the reader knows that whatever is happening is a horrible, disaster. Yeah. yeah, tragic, terrible, disastrous thing. But the way that Ismuth writes it, everything is so 
credible. It is so true. Mm -hmm. And it is done in a very um, unemotional, impassioned way so that there's no, uh, so that the reader is sort of swept along. And then uh, the, during uh, during some point in the story, uh, there is a particular scene where uh, he tries to, um, he starts to flirt with this younger sister. And, you know, with a flirt, I mean, I'm saying flirt, but I mean, you know, he'll make some remark and he'll smile or, you know, he'll try to tease her. And then at one point towards the end of the story, uh, the uh, he um, she takes him some halwa that he has uh, his sister has made for him, and you have to read the story in order to understand it. When I tell you, when I narrate it, or I'm telling you, it doesn't quite have that same impact. But he he we believe as readers, I believe, as a very close you know in in the close reading of the text that he tries to attack her sexually. Mm. And, uh, and, and we don't know what happens exactly. I, we don't think he, you know, goes all the way, but whatever, he does attack her in some way. And uh, then the next part of the story is that he leaves after that because um, he was actually there just to take an exam and he uh, had, didn't have an, a place to stay. And this person was his aunt and these were his cousins. And so he was staying here. And so he leaves. Of course, there is no wedding. There is no um, uh, proposal. And Kubra uh, is, has been quietly suffering from TB, uh, which nobody had known about. And she dies eventually. I mean, it's it all happens in the space of a short story. Well, and so the... But let me just let me. I, there's one thing I forgot forgot to tell you that Kubra's mother is a is a woman who has these amazing sewing st stitching sewing skills, sartorial skills, and the story begins with her helping the women in the village um, put things together. Uh, in uh, you know even if they're short of a piece of fabric or a swatch you know how it is in our households in the old days when our aunts and our grandmothers used to all sit around and stitch things and they had a basket with swatches and all that and so at the end of the story the story ends with Kubra's mother doing the same for a coffin mm -hmm. a shroud for her daughter who's yeah. dead so I interrupted you. You were asking a question. I was going to say that um, this gives us a great segue to talk about the body torn, mm -hmm. which you translated of Shamita Riaz's work. Mm -hmm. And why don't we, uh, when we come back, let's uh, let's talk about that briefly. Oh, sure, right? sure. And but before we uh, go into that, uh, before we end this segment. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, Femida Riaz's place in mm -hmm. poet, mm -hmm. uh, in Urdu poet. Yeah. So, are we taking a break? No. no go ahead. No. So, um, Femida, um, so so I just want to uh, start with a disclaimer that I have never before Femida never translated any poetry. And the reason I never translated poetry is that it is a very, very difficult task to do. It's very, it's next to impossible to uh, f to be satisfied with 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 translation of poetry, because it is so much. Um, there is so much emotion packed in such a small space that to then transfer that into Urdu with no leeway, with no space to work around, and just to have it there so that it's just as powerful or almost as powerful as the original is next to impossible. So there is a story about my uh, project on Femida. Perhaps I should begin with that. Mm -hmm. She had come to the United States. This is, of course, a while back, pre-pandemic, long time ago. Uh, to more than 10 years, 10 years, I think. 
she had come to the United States and we had uh, I had arranged for her to come to, to NYU uh, for a talk. And she had just finished translating. She had actually just published a translation of Shams Tabrez and, uh, by Rumi. And so um, she was at NYU. I was meeting her for the first time. And I remember seeing her. She was outside, standing outside the doors uh, of the Kevorkian Center and smoking. And, uh, um, you know, there was a bunch of people standing around her. She was wearing a white kurta, white shalwar. It was summer and a white dupatta. And she looked so beautiful. And, uh, you know, and she was just uh, uh, very carelessly, not even bothering who's looking, who's not looking. So anyway, uh, I saw her then and I, you know, welcomed her. And, and then she, you know, came in and she started talking uh, about her experiences of translating uh, this wonderful work uh, by Rumi, which uh, is in the form of a ghazal. So she told, while she was talking, she explained, and she was in another world altogether. I mean, we were all sitting there and watching her, and it seemed as though she was an other otherworldly person who was just sitting there on this table at the Kevorkian Center Library. And uh, suddenly she was, you know, part of this whole uh, beautiful poem that she had translated from Persian to Urdu. Mm -hmm. And in translating it, she explained um, how she would hum the original Rumi in Persian and roam around the house humming it. And as she was humming it, she would have these, uh, the, the Urdu equivalents of those words, of the ghazals, drop into her head. And the marvelous thing is that she translated meter for meter. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to do. I mean, let me just tell you that. I mean, I don't know how she did and uh, I just, I cannot imagine. Um, there was so, much musicality in her delivery and her way yeah, of speaking. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the fact that she was able to do that is, is a, that metrical equivalence is such a difficult thing to even imagine for the best of, uh, uh, the best poets ever. Mm -hmm. You know, they will, they might translate it, they might have some kind of an equivalence, but she was doing this Persian Urdu equivalence, which and then she read it. She read the Urdu and then she read the Persian and then she read the Urdu. Anyway, after she left, I just felt, you know, I have to look at, I did not, I was not familiar with her work. And I said, I have to look at her work. And of course, we also had um, another event after that in which we had people come in and uh, read papers on uh, on on Femida, and so I I began to un, uh, actually learn about Femida, and I started to read her work, uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to translate this, and I don't know why I thought that, except that something inside me said, you know, I I need to ex uh, translate this. We're going and, to stop here, Thaira, and uh, then we'll come back and talk sure. more. And the body torn uh, translated by you of Femida Riaz's work is available, as you know, on the Little Book Company uh, ebook platform. And this was published by Maktabai Danyal. No, this was published by Folio. That's right. Folio Books out of Lahore. Right, right. All right. So we, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a break here, a pause, okay. and we'll be right back. Okay. Taira, you're such a wonderful storyteller that I think it's impossible for you to talk without telling stories. But I, <laughs> I think that that's an advantage as well as a disadvantage because I go from place to place to place. Well, uh, but but mesmerized. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let us come back to your writing, to 
for your recently published first novel, mm -hmm. Street Teacher of Lahore, um, which uh, uh, I heard you read uh, uh, about a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, let you introduce it a bit, or mm -hmm. would you like me to introduce it? You can introduce it. I think that would be nice, yes. So the history teacher of Lahore uh, begins in Sialkot and then moves to Lahore, and it's a, it's a story of a history teacher, um, uh, Arif Ali, and his mentor, uh, not a mentor as my, in terms of his uh, teacher, but a mentor uh, named Kamran, who's uh, older than him. And the story is, you can say, uh, Arif's awakening into the political context of Pakistan uh, just around the time of Ziaul Haq, post Zia, uh, late 70s to 80s, and all that that uh, dictatorship's uh, dark days entailed. And it seems to me, uh, Tahira, you've, uh, you've strung together many uh, facts of that time, those awful facts in a way that aren't uh, sort of sequential as they occurred, but they're all there to create the, the, the real history of what happened in Pakistan as opposed to the state narrative that has been fed to Pakistanis uh, during this period, which has uh, tried to erase the awfulness uh, of um, overturning uh, democracy. Yes. Uh, yes. So um, the story of this novel is also, I think I, I did mention it when we were doing the reading, uh, is long. So I'm going to try to summarize it very quickly for you. So it, uh, I, I began writing this after a visit, to, I have been visit. I mean, every, uh, every from the time that we arrived in this country in 1971, we have gone back home nearly every year. Uh, and so, on one of these trips in the um, later, this is post Zia era, I um, I heard someone say. Karachi has become the killing fields of Pakistan. And, or, or I read an article. And uh, I, I haven't been a political person. In other words, I'm not a person who talks politics a great deal or who was very interested in politics per se. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, uh, for some reason, uh, it, uh, that got to me. And we are... I am from Lahore, and we in Lahore have all our lives treated Karachi as this far away place, almost another country. Mm. Where we, you know, for example, uh, in all my life, in all these years, I must have visited Karachi a total of perhaps four or five times. And mm. I discovered that that was also the case in those days, especially. Uh, when we didn't have, uh, you know, we didn't fly so much, but we mostly were using the train, uh, was the case with people from Karachi. So mm -hmm. Lahore were, for them was, you know, a, a strange place to visit. And anyway, uh, I started to uh, think about that. And after I got home, I also um, a, began a subscription to Newsline and um, the other journal, um, Herald. And when I started looking at those, and I used to get them every month, and I started reading them, I became, I started to familiarize myself and, with the situation in Pakistan. And I was particularly, uh, how shall I say, uh, moved and strangely sort of moved and I could not quite understand and couldn't quite comprehend what was happening with the blasphemy law. Mm. At, at that time, Christians were the um, the target, and um, I went to visit my um, my oldest and dearest friend, Mother Andrew, who was my teacher as well at the convent of Jesus and Mary, 
and uh, she complained bitterly of uh, what they were doing to the Christians. Mm. And there had been cases with uh, Father Joseph Massey, and there was uh, another young uh, man who was in prison. And Father Massey, I think that was his name, if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly, uh, they had imprisoned him, and that eventually he was found hanging in his prison cell. And it was said that he had hung himself. And of course, there was, there were uh, in facts, facts actually to the contrary. Um, and so, uh, and so, mother was mother Andrew was so upset, and she said to me, uh, you know, when one of theirs dies, he's a shaheed, and when one of ours dies, it's like, oh, you know, he was a Christian and he died. And then she talked about Asma Jahangir, who was also one of her students. Asma was many years junior to me. And she said, oh, you know, uh, Tahira, my dear, dear Asma, she's helping us. She's helping us. And so, you know, I'm, I was very close to Mother Andrew all my life. And I, you know, spent a long years at the Convent of Jesus and Mary. I, I I still remember that place as if it was yesterday. And so for some reason, I was, you know, I became very interested in this, in the stories of these um, blasphemy cases. And I started reading about them. And at the same time, I wanted to write a novel. And I was thinking about women as well, because I, you know, I'm interested in, in women and what happens to them and how, uh, what what goes on in their lives. And so I started writing this novel, which um, became long and convoluted. And uh, and I, I think I had about 500 pages of it, in which um, there is uh, the, the, uh, the protagonist. There, there are these two people. One is Arif, and uh, he is, as you see him, in uh, the history teacher of Lahore. And then there is a young woman who is Rabia, who is also from a small town. And so it was the story of these two people whose lives converge. And with her, it was the story of a young woman who is going through a crisis um, as a member of a particular society. Again, you know, I think I, a lot like Ismat's women, targeted by the by the customs and the traditions that they have to grow up in and she is obsessed with reading with books all my characters are needless to say and so she cannot continue her education she has to get married i won't tell you the story because that's a ma another manuscript now <laughs> and it's waiting to be <laughs> published but anyway so i what i did is in uh so, so that was complete, and then I never, it never saw the light of day as a novel, the whole mm -hmm. thing. And in uh, during the pandemic, to cut a long story short, I uh, extracted Arif's story from that novel and uh, polished it and worked on it, and it became the history teacher of Lahore. So the the story was already there. I added a great deal to it. And I have to say that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that I did. It's this is not a book of history; it's a book of fiction. But it uses the political um, drama, the political strife, um, all of the terrible things and the good things that happened to Pakistan during that time and afterwards and before. And I wanted to make that the backdrop of a story that I wanted to tell. And so um, I and, and and a lot of the incidents that are in the novel, and perhaps you may have recognized some, mm -hmm. I took from Herald, from Newsline, from Dawn. And so I didn't have to sadly make anything up. Yeah, I, it, it was it, it was all there. So you know, it was just fictionalized. You know, you're a writer yourself. We take these things and then we manipulate them and then we work with them and we turn them into a story rather than just a uh, political account. Well, so, if I may uh, just interrupt sorry. you for something here. Uh, 
you know, when I wrote my first novel, Mass Transit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was uh, based in Karachi, working in Karachi in uh, the 80s. Mm -hmm. I relied, uh, well, I, uh, you know, traveled all over the city from end to end on my own, but I also, uh, the Newsline and the Herald were my my companions. Um, yes. I would wait eagerly for the issue, and then I learned so much about what was really the backstory yes. of, yes. of the fire that I'd seen burning uh, yes. piles away in Karachi, or the death that had happened as just some murder, but was much bigger than just that was a political murder. And this was all being done by these brave and wonderful journalists. And there was one journalist in particular whose stories I just read so carefully. Her name was Amne Azam Ali. Oh, okay. And she was a courageous uh, woman who whose writing really affected me. Mm. And when I was writing Mass Transit, uh, I I too was uh, was very much influenced not only by my own experience uh, in what I saw in Karachi, the political, mm. uh, in this was still Ziaul Haq's period, but also by the, the what the journalists were actually documenting and recording so bravely. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, absolutely. In fact, I wanted to mention, and I, I'm glad you rem have reminded me now, that uh, I heard the podcast yesterday uh, where you interviewed um, Hassan Mushtaba. Yes. And as I listened to that, to him, I thought I had literary deja vu, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, my God, he's talking about my novel. And everything that he said mm -hmm. resonated with me. And I thought, you know, and here you are telling your story. So, and we also, and you said in the interview yesterday, that despite everything, there is something wonderful about that country, about the people that inhabit that country, and the kind of potential there was and is there, and how all of us have actually drawn from it. We, the, it, it has filled our lives. It, I mean, I would be yeah, wrong for it. Yeah, yeah. Wrong for it. Exactly. I and mean, I all the time. It's never ending. I noticed earlier when you said, um, and then when I, and I go home every year. You yes, yes. And you've been here 50? 50, 53 years. Three years. And you are yeah. saying, when every I. Every year. Home, every year. Every year. And it and um, I uh, now that my <clears throat> children, excuse me, are you know grown and they have their own families. Uh, my my uh, middle uh, the middle son, uh, who is uh, who lives close by and he's married to a, a, a wonderful young woman from Pakistan actually. Uh, he she has family in Pakistan, so now they still go now they go every year. And she takes the kids every year. And then I go with them. Mm -hmm. I was la <laughs> last year, I was in Pakistan twice. <laughs> once for the <laughs> point out that uh, then you said, and then I brought, uh, then I, when I got home, I yeah. subscribed to these articles. So you went home yes. and then you got back home. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. This is Absolutely. And I'm home. I'm always, so that space that is Pakistan. And also I want to say that this novel, and I, I think I'm going to say this a lot when I talk about it, it's an elegy and it's also an ode. It's a lament also, but it's also an ode. Mm -hmm. It's a poem of love. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the to go back a little bit, my first set of short stories, which was Atar of Roses and Other Stories of Pakistan, began. That's where it, it begins. The, the and and I and I don't call it nostalgia because nostalgia is for things that no longer happen, you know. But for me and for you as well, I'm quite sure, and for Hassan, as he was saying, you know, that we are always in the in that space, whether we, no matter where we are. And so we're experiencing it firsthand almost. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I also was discussing this with my daughter-in-law, who's a newer 
new immigrant. She's only been here 20 years. And I was, uh, and we, I was telling her, and we were talking about this, that the older I get, the more I inhabit that space, mm -hmm. but not with nostalgia as much as with a deep sense of, of my presence being there, you know, as, as if I'm there. And so there is no nostalgia. It's I'm there. So in that sense, uh, you know, the, the the novel becomes it's just I'm just I'm just narrating a story simply because I feel that it has to be written down and I'm sharing with the with the written uh, uh, with the with the with the with the page with these pages with the written word something that I feel and if I keep feeling it and I don't write it if I don't record it it's as if then it will be lost because when I go then it will be lost so the, it's so important, you know, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're filled with the sense of importance of this place. That thing of, of documenting it. For, yeah. yeah. It like that way when I wrote, it's not a novel, when I wrote, a, a, you can call it a memoir, a guest in the house. Yes, yes. It was in a very special moment. And if I didn't write it all down, I wanted it, when I was leaving Pakistan, I wanted to carry all that with me. Yes. keep it alive with me as as that space that you're referring to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah which it isn't nostalgia mm -hmm. it's living and breathing now yes exactly exactly and that is what this novel has been for me so when i go when i went back to it um when i started to you know reread and and edit and polish and put things in it was as if, you know, it was like, oh, okay, this is an old uh, a friend of mine and I'm, you know, I'm just looking at it again. And then I put more things in. And it, it of course, there's a great deal of sadness, not so much, not nostalgia, but a sadness that things have not changed, the, the blasphemy law business, the persecution of the minorities. Uh, so all of that is is you know, fills me with sadness. But the other things, you know, the city and the sounds, the noises, the memories, the, the buildings, the food, the people, all of that is so amazingly, uh, you know, tangible. And at the same time, it makes, fills you with this joy. Um, and, um, it, it, and, and now the second part, which is which I call the cry of the nightingale, because it's Rabia's story, and it's it is also a story that starts out in sadness, but it also brings her to Lahore. She is she comes from he comes from Sialkot, she comes from Sahiwal. So I don't know why I go to these small cities. I have never lived in Sahiwal, nor have I lived in Sialkot. But the transition is always important because otherwise I don't have anything to contrast it with, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, when they come to Lahore, something happens to these people, to these characters. And so Lahore is the microcosm of Pakistan for me. And so they have to come here. And when they come to Lahore, then they are they become part of Lahore. And then in essence, they are now telling the history of Pakistan. Hmm. These characters. Interesting. I think that's the kind of, you know, if I were, I mean, I'm doing an analysis as we speak here. Interesting. Your words are making me, you know, think. I want to get into a fight with you on what is the microcosm of uh, of, uh, of I <laughs> Say, uh, stay in your lane on that one. Okay. Yeah. She is a microcosm of Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah, um, but for me, you know, and for you, but, but you know, that is what is so beautiful, Maniza. It doesn't matter. I'm sure someone in Sialkot is thinking of Sialkot as the yeah. microcosm of Pakistan. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, I actually have a beautiful short story, which I love because it just came out from 
I my one visit first very early visits to Karachi later on I mean after I was married and all and uh, it's uh, it it actually became uh, that story was was became a kind of a, um, a seed mm -hmm. for these other things that I've done the novel and you know uh, about this uh, about um, the children remember there were these kids who were these uh, beggar, little begging beggars. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember or not. And they were playing and a bomb went off and they were killed. And the walls were splattered with their blood. I read that. I didn't see it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it had happened in Karachi. So I, I wrote a story, which was, again, you know, there's always a love story, of course. And uh, um, and and that was the very much like Arif, that young man. Whatever happens to him, mm -hmm. happened to that young man and the protagonist in that story. So that was my first story. But it it was a Karachi. It was based in Karachi, so to speak. But of course, I had to move back to Lahore in order to uh, you know really tell the story. When we left Pakistan and the day we were leaving Lahore and all our hundreds of friends were at the airport saying goodbye to us, and we were all weeping away mm. at this dying. that uh, leaving Lahore was uh, so difficult and the end of the world, it seemed. Mm. And, uh, and then life goes on. Yeah. And no, I, actually, when we left Lahore, I was, um, you know, 25, and I had a two-month-old uh, baby boy, and... We were just coming to America for a little bit. Mm -hmm. We were not planning to stay yeah. at all. I and, uh, yeah, we, we, there was no, so there was no sadness in leaving. In fact, very, very excited. Oh, Chalo, we're yes. going to America. We're going to have some fun there. Yes. And, uh, you know, and then that was that. But as time went on, as so, so the sadness began to set in when my uh, parents passed away. Mm. And I thought, my mom, first my mother passed away. And of course, that's a huge anchor that's just wrenched away from you. Mm -hmm. And uh, then slowly uh, other relatives, but then my father, my father lived for quite a while after she had passed away. And so I had a home there. Mm -hmm. But I think I was, we were talking about that the other day, that uh, when I went to Pakistan last year, for the first time in my life in 79 years, I didn't have a home in Lahore. Oh. There was no home because the last home that, you know, my father's home had would be, had become my brother's home and then he sold it and he came back to America. So I, st of course, stayed with my sister. My youngest sister is there uh, and uh, her home is the nicest, one most wonderful place in the world for me. And I told her, I said, Chabnam, your home is now my home. In, rather than her to say, my home is your home, I said to her, you know, now your home is my home. And I made it my home. And I be going back again. I'm going to stay with her. And, but the point is that it hit me when I got off, uh, yes. when I came out of the airport. In fact, when the plane landed. Yes. We know when the plane lands, you must have that experience too. When the plane lands, you have this most unbelievable, strange feeling when you're coming down on Lahore. And I've always had it regardless, you know, each year is the mm -hmm. same. So when I, it was the usual, and then suddenly it struck me like a hammer on my head that, oh my God, this is the first time in my life that I don't have a home here. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, for about 15 minutes. It really, it it was terrible. I wept and I thought, oh my God, you know, and then, you know, it was it was gone. You come down, you see Lahore, and you come down, you drive down from the airport towards Malo Down, and, and it's like, it's all right. It's, it, this is Lahore. You're back. <laughs> it's okay. I was um, sitting at the airport in uh, Sarajevo, mm -hmm. and a gentleman sitting across from me, and at that time, uh, he would have been about maybe uh, 10 15 years older than myself. And uh, he had been visiting uh, Sarajevo. He had migrated to the United States and he was visiting 
for a few weeks. Mm. And he expressed, we got to talking, and he expressed his sadness, um, not, not about leaving as much as just his general sadness mm. about being there. And I asked him why, and he said, because I've been walking these streets uh, searching for my 16-year-old self. Oh, yes. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I guess you know when you leave a place and mm. you're young and you have all and yeah. with youth is beautiful. Yes, it is. But you know, with you and perhaps with you and with me as a, as well, definitely, because we visited so much, we went back so often mm -hmm. that um, for me the progression, growing up, growing older, was not something that uh, you know I missed in that sense. I never had to look for myself as a 16-year-old mm -hmm. because I the 16-year-old was still there within me and I had been visiting her every single year. You know what I mean? It, yeah, I do. And Yeah, it was just, uh, it's still there. Yeah, and, very and, much so. Yeah, very much so, sometimes to an alarming degree. <laughs> and you think, well, you know, you really are not 16 anymore or 20. So but, true. Uh, <laughs> But you have, but you know, that's, uh, that's a blessing. That's it's a, a blessing. blessing. Yeah, it's, yeah. A blessing. yeah, it's a blessing. And uh, so anyway, this, so the novel then, um, in fact, uh, my uh, editor, that I had titled the novel, The History Teacher, mm -hmm. my wonderful edit editor at Speaking Tiger Books, Renuka mm -hmm. Chatterjee, Mm -hmm. said, why don't we do the history teacher of Lahore? And in the beginning, when she said that, I said, hmm, that's a bit, sounds a bit odd. But then after a while, I it, I got used to, the, to it. And now I think, oh my God, thank God for editors. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just, uh, it just adds this. She said, you know, people won't know. Uh, until they've read the novel and this will be a way for those and of course you know I mean it is for it's for everybody the novel is for everybody but those who have lived and loved Lahore lived in and loved Lahore the novel has a special kind of resonance it's very evocative I've been told I mean you know yeah. I've lived it so for me it's different but for the readers um, they're like, oh, Taira, you know, especially a couple of my friends who haven't gone back in years to Pakistan mm -hmm. and who are from Lahore and uh, just one particular friend who was my school friend. And she said, oh, Taira, I, I, I felt as though I was back in Lahore and I was walking the streets of Lahore and you made me feel like I was home again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. That was the nicest thing that anyone had ever said to me about my work. And the connotation of the history teacher of Lahore, because yes. after all, Lahore has been the seat of power, has yes. been the seat yes. of culture, has been the seat of politics. It yeah. is a seat of art. And yeah. so the history of that city yeah. in the oh, 80s, yeah. That yeah. 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 It, it is. It, it, so it becomes... So actually, the title was something else, and I, I don't even remember what it was now. Mm -hmm. But I suddenly, one fine day, when I was finishing up, uh, uh, you know, just ready for the manuscript to go out, I changed the title. And I thought, you know, it has to be the history teacher. Because it was about Arif, and it was about history. And as you said before, you know, I, I wanted to take all these all these events, all the po politics, the political things that were happening, uh, there was actually a larger segment with the situation with the Ahmadis in it also. Mm -hmm. And I took that out because I felt, you know, it becomes a little, I mean, I'm trying to do a, too much in too little a space and it may just become too much to take. But um, I wanted to take all of that because that was part of the history of that city and the country subsequently. And I wanted that to be the backdrop. If you skip anything, then it's it's not quite complete. 
and uh, so so arif had has to be had to be the the every man of pakistan yes you know and he he had to be this person who through whom the story of that country is being told it's not just his story it's a story of that country and the failures and the successes and the joys and the sorrows and the sadness and everything so that so so, so as you said you know i just took these events and i put them in and they're not in order that and i didn't i mean i could have done it but i didn't want to no that's the way we rem- our memory the way we remember things yeah. is not in yeah. order it exactly. is all jumbled up but it all amounts to the same yeah, yeah it's the it's the um, combined collective feeling uh, and the the memory and the images etc that matter in the end and because i mean as i said this is not a book of history it's a it's a book of fiction it's telling a story but it's all there you know i wanted it to be there one of the reviewers just recently um i just got the review yesterday in india said that um she was um and i want to ask you if you feel that way she said that it was disappointing that the poems and uh, the uh, the uh, couplets were not in urdu as well or transliterated and she would have had the pleasure would have been doubled had they been there and i thought well you know you it's you can't do that simply because that the there are uh, technical issues with transliterations and with um uh, putting urdu script in in books um they make mistakes and there are so many errors i tried to put the the on the first page if you may remember there is a poem there are a couple of couplets from my father's poem mm-hmm. and they're all over the place i mean i wanted them to be aligned you know and so i so for that reason i i have avoided that plus i don't think editors want you know this kind not, of uh, not in a novel uh, you know right uh, i'm having she, no, uh, she, she mentioned devakaruni and uh, some other particular indian writer and how they had done it and how wonderful it was so i said okay fine that's you know i'm not doing it i am at the moment uh, well it's done now uh, working with my father on his uh, book on uh, mirza ghalib and ye uh, dehmad oh. and ikbal and we have uh, done that uh, we've uh, done the uh, roman english the english translation, the translation and of the text script which uh, uh, i'm very grateful to ali mead for having so mm. you know faithfully put all the urdu script into this yeah and, but that's not a novel no and, no no i mean if i were doing that i would do the same actually i didn't do it with famida people asked me why i haven't done it with famida and the reason is that um ye, this person this young man who uh, who did the uh did the uh, publishing in pakistan you know i he wasn't i mean they i would have had difficulty with him doing it and i was afraid that there would be mistakes and things like that because i didn't have that much control i wasn't there and uh, for 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 all kinds of reasons no you did also, the right yeah thing. also you know maniza one of one of my one of the things that i really need to say is about translation is that um translation from urdu texts is for people who can't read urdu i i never i've never thought of i actually don't even read my own translations once they're out there mm-hmm. because these i i'm i'm not translating for someone whose urdu is great and who can read the text in urdu that's not that person who who will read this translation translations are generally for people who cannot read you know we read tolstoy and dostoevsky because we can't read uh, russian and you know uh, all the other languages that we one million languages that we read in translation so uh, our purpose is not to read it in in uh, in the language in it was written yes uh, well so- uh, uh, tyra we've got very limited time and uh, oh. just i want to ask you one uh, Gee, question so- have you thought about having your book or doing it yourself rather since you are a translator translating it into urdu 
No, I haven't. And I, I don't think I would do it myself. Mm -hmm. But if someone else wanted to do it, certainly I wouldn't mind at all. I would, you know, encourage uh, people I mean, if somebody wanted to do it. Uh, and as for translating into Urdu, I'll also add before we go quickly that I am at the moment translating Marquez, uh, uh, Garcia Marquez's uh, uh, Autumn of the Patriarch into Urdu. And this is the first time thing for me because I've always done English, Urdu mm -hmm. to English. Mm -hmm. So now I'm doing English to Urdu. It's a Gregory Rabasa translation that I'm doing. And it's a monumental work. I don't know if you remember, but there is no punctuation and there are no paragraphs <laughs> in that novel. Kind of writing, no punctuation and no <laughs> paragraphs, no grammar needed, just how yeah. on. It yeah. just goes, it just plows on. And so anyway, so but I undertook it and I'm up to almost 200 pages of it. And so that's going to be the next big thing that I do. Well, Tyra, before we Thank go, so uh, much. I want to say that I look forward to bringing all your books to the little I book. I would be happy, yes. I would be so happy to share all of them with you. So yeah. I'm going to try to do that. Thank you so Thank much, Neza. Good luck with everything and thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you. It's been a lovely conversation. Shukriya. You're welcome. Bye-bye.